and we're live. Cool. Hey, everybody. Welcome to September 22nd. Well, sorry. The September 22nd uh, MakerDAO community call. My name is David Utrobin. I uh, work at the Maker Foundation uh, and have been a longtime MakerDAO community member. And I get the good pleasure of facilitating these calls every Tuesday. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, welcome to the call. If you're new to the call, um, I'll give you some just some brief context about what it's about. Uh, this is meant to be kind of a, a weekly update for uh, the typical MakerDAO uh, kind of conscientious observer, maker voter, etc. So you can come on this call and kind of get uh, get a, a brief update on what's been happening during the week. We also use this call to uh, uh, to introduce interesting guests, interesting projects that are happening in the space. Uh, and also, yeah, just talk with community members, engage in discussions, and we really are kind of um, exploring the different formats uh, and uh, and ways that we could leverage this call to be interesting and, and valuable for you, the viewer. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, today is September 22nd. We don't have any special guests today. Um, actually, we uh, it was a bit of a snafu because uh, I had thought that uh, this call was reserved for the NFT badges team, which, uh, uh, if you don't know, uh, I'll give you guys the rundown. But we have a group of contributors uh, in the community who are building uh, an NFT uh, kind of generator and bridge to the MakerDAO forum. So you're able to kind of link your ETH address to your forum account, and then you're able to claim uh, various NFTs that... Uh, that unlock with different actions that you've taken on chain. So if your ETH address, for example, earned one die in DSR at some point, there's an NFT for that. If you've ever um, initiated a, a, a vault's liquidation, you get another, you know, an NFT for that. If you've ever voted in governance, you get an NFT for that. Uh, and uh, and so yeah, this this working group, uh, this NFT badges group, uh, really was. Uh, experimenting with bridging Web 3 and Web 2. Uh, and so, yeah, they're actually not going to be on the call today, but they will be on this coming Thursday's Governance and Risk call. They're going to be doing a brief demo and explanation of the things that they've been building uh, and, a, and a reveal of the actual NFTs. So I'm really excited for that. Uh, for today, we're just going to be going through kind of the week's updates. Uh, well, at rather, the weekly Maker Relay, which is posted on Monday evening. Uh, and it's a great uh, kind of roundup of what's happening in voting, uh, what's happening in uh, in some of the, the updates from various teams. We have MIPS updates and domain team updates. And then we have highlights from the community. And so uh, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen so that my my uh, beautiful face isn't all you have to check it out uh check out oh no that's toggling my video oops wrong button oh yeah and huge credit to uh lewis from uh from i believe he's on the brazil brazil action group team i hope i hope i hope i'm getting that right but uh lewis was actually on a recent community call with a bunch of other uh uh uh, community members from Latin America, they actually have uh, gone ahead and and uh, and uh, translated Maker Relay 13, which is really exciting. So we are now getting this uh, into the hands of even more uh, potential MakerDAO community members in different parts of the world in different languages, just like a global decentralized protocol should be aiming for, right? All right, so I believe you should be able to see my screen now. I, I I hope my face, yeah, I guess like my face is on the bottom right. I wonder if I could move it to like the bottom. Sorry, it's on the bottom left. I wonder if I can move it to the bottom right. I can't. Oh, that's fine. Uh, I guess I'm going to zoom in this a little bit. I think, uh, yeah, I think that should be good. All right, cool. So Maker Relay 13. Uh, yeah, uh, so huge props, by the way, to uh, Tim, Anna, and a number of others uh, who are uh, MakerDAO community members who every week uh, put their brains together Monday evening and put this thing together. Um, so a uh, huge shout out to them for putting this stuff up. Yeah, wait, I just said that. What? See, 
Happy Tuesday morning, everybody. Happy Tuesday morning. So let's get into it. Uh, so first, uh, the first section that is in Maker Relay is the votes that are happening. And so we're actually currently, uh, it's September 22nd, which is uh, corresponding to week three of the uh, MIPS governance cycle. Uh, so the monthly governance cycle, I mean. Uh, and as part of uh, the governance cycle, uh, in the beginning of the month, a <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks, Akim, I appreciate it. In the beginning of the month, uh, a bunch of MIPS and uh, and sub proposals to these MIPS uh, are proposed. Uh, week two, they go through an inclusion poll where maker voters basically say, okay, we want to bundle these together uh, and potentially have them pass at, by the end of the month. So then, in week three. Uh, this bundled set of uh, of MIPS and subproposals goes through a governance poll, and that's the governance poll that is live right now. Uh, and if the poll passes, then uh, then these MIPS right here are going to be uh, basically going to a executive vote on September twenty eighth, which is uh, next Monday. Uh, and so if uh, if that happens, then we're going to see a bunch of really cool stuff. Uh, implemented. So for example, uh, we are going to have three new, uh, sorry, my highlighter is going everywhere. So we're going to have actually three new uh, vault types. If uh, if this executive goes through next week, we're going to have loop ring, aka LRC, we're going to have compounds, governance token, uh, and we're going to have the, uh, the link token also as collateral. Uh, and if you're interested in kind of the, the details for any of these, you could check out uh, the discussion thread that's linked here in the Maker Relay. And as part of the the actual onboarding proposal, uh, all of the different domain team assessments are linked. So you can actually check out the Oracle team assessment, the Smart Contracts team assessment, and the risk assessment. If you're curious about what the vault type parameters are going to be, the risk domain team assessment is what you're looking for. And uh, just as an example, I'll show you link here. Uh, so link... Uh, as you can see, uh, William Remore did this uh, did this analysis, and so I believe at the very bottom, uh, yeah, they, he, there's so much rich info in here. It's great. So I believe towards the bottom is the uh, uh, the proposed uh, parameters. Here we go. So uh, so yeah, what you're voting for as a maker voter is basically a 2% stability fee, since the base rate is 0% right now, a liquidation ratio of 175%, which is slightly higher than uh, what, we, what we're used to with ETH at least, uh, a very small debt ceiling, 5 million, uh, an auction lot size, this has to do with the liquidation of the vaults. Uh, this is pretty standard, 50,000 with a 3% bid increment with a six hour auction duration, uh, standard liquidation penalty of 13%, and then a, a dust amount of 100 die, which just means that you can't borrow less than 100 die minimum. So this actually prevents uh, spam vaults, so people can't like put up five dollars of link and borrow a dollar of die uh, because of gas prices. That actually makes it very inefficient for liquidators to ever like re like liquidate those vaults. So it's just a uh, security parameter. So you have to borrow at least 100 bucks, basically. So yeah. Uh, if you're interested in in that for the other two, feel free to check out the discussion and do exactly what I did. Uh, they're formatted the same, so you'll see the same uh, domain team uh, assessments in those uh, proposals. Uh, likewise, there's a, a couple of domain team changes that are being proposed. So for risk, they're actually, I believe, uh, formally onboarding Primoz. Uh, Primoz Cordes has been... Uh, somewhat on the risk team and working with Cyrus before he uh, Cyrus retired. Uh, but Primoz ha has been uh, uh, leading the team called Block Analytica. I believe he's the founder of it. Uh, who, uh, yeah, he, he's he's the guy. He is he is one of the, the a very smart mind in, in terms of crypto risk. Um, I definitely have a lot of respect for him, just generally speaking. 
And then uh, secondarily, uh, we are also formally onboarding a number of people to the uh, smart contracts team. So these include people that you've seen in governance calls a ton, like Will Barnes, who actually spearheaded the uh, dark spell mechanism that's being voted in this month. Lucas Manuel, Brian McMichael, who's often on actually these community calls. Uh, Christopher Mooney as well, uh, who I believe is going to be taking a, uh, a more public role in... Um, in representing the uh, smart contracts domain team. And so, yeah, we are formally onboarding these applicants to the team, uh, which is really exciting. And then the last two things in the uh, bundle are uh, this uh, declaration of intent, which doesn't actually create anything except for like a solidified uh, signal from MKR voters that yes, this is actually what we do want in the roadmap. Uh, and the declaration of intent is for a die flash mint module. Uh, and the thinking behind this is really interesting. Like since the maker protocol is actually uh, the source of die, right? When somebody opens uh, a vault, they generate the die themselves. And then when they pay back the die, they're actually destroying it from the supply. So why can't we actually create a die flash mint module? If a person borrows the die and returns it in the same block, then technically, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of a no-brainer. So uh, it's really exciting to see this uh, surfaced, created, and uh, proposed, and slowly but surely being passed by the community. And then the last uh, thing is MIP15, the dark spell mechanism. Yeah, exactly, Lewis. Exactly like Ave flash loans. You're exactly right. But this would be specifically for die, not for any other. Because I think you could do a flash loan with like ETH and all the other different uh, supported collateral types on Aave. Or asset types, I mean. Yeah, so MIP15 is the dark spell mechanism. So this has been uh, in the works basically since uh, the uh, Black Thursday events uh, back in March when uh, the pandemic uh, fear wreaked havoc on the markets. Uh, so the dark spell mechanism, actually it might've even been proposed before that, but basically I'll give you the, the context. The dark spell mechanism is a process for uh, passing uh, bug fixes to the maker protocol in a uh, sort of semi-private way. So the problem with passing any bug fix is this, it's, you know, when you create a vote and it gets passed, there's a governance delay before any code changes or state changes to the protocol happens. And I think the governance delay right now is four hours or six hours. I'm not 100% sure. But the problem is when you're putting up a bug fix and it's critical. Yeah, six hours. Thanks, Tim. Uh, so if you're putting up a bug fix and it's, uh, uh, and it's public code that anybody could read on chain and that's like a six hour window for somebody to reverse engineer your fix, figure out what the bug is and attack the protocol. So uh, there has to be a way to fix it. And so the dark spell mechanism tackles that exact problem. Uh, it actually involves uh, a really interesting process of obfuscating the bytecode. Um, well, actually just, I think posting it as bytecode because I think the obfuscation happens at higher levels of abstraction. Uh, but what's interesting is uh, that there's a number of stakeholders that are part of this process. So the smart contracts domain team is part of the process. A trusted third party, meaning like an auditing an auditing firm or uh, somebody that is vouched for, kind of trusted third party, to be able to uh, verify publicly that yes, this bug fix is like needed, and we will we will like. Uh, explain what it is after we pass the vote. The governance facilitator, obviously, to in, you know entrust everything, and the, the maker community, because at a certain level, the maker community, by and large, has to trust the governance facilitator, the third party, and the smart contracts domain team to pass this bug fix. Uh, because if the public governance community can see it, then guess what? Uh, any random person on the internet can see it, which might be a black hat. Right, right. So, and black hat. I mean, by black hat hacker, somebody who would be uh, exploiting the bug fix. So it's really, really uh, interesting and well thought through. So big credits to Will Barnes. Uh, all right, cool. Yeah. So that's what's part of the MIPS monthly governance poll. I highly suggest you check out that uh, poll and vote for it if you're an MKR holder. 
uh, or don't vote for it. And uh, if you don't vote for it and are like severely against any of these, I highly suggest you comment in the forums and give your reasoning because if you don't give your reasoning, then, you know, the ha feedback is very important. And so, especially in public governance with a bunch of uh, pseudonymous people. So yeah, a uh, weekly governance cycle. Uh, oh yeah, there's one day yeah, there's basically two days left on this uh, MIPS monthly governance poll, so go vote. Yeah, thanks for that. Oh, dude, you're yeah. Don't worry, Tim. You're you're giving important uh, information that I'm missing, so don't, don't even worry about it. Uh, yeah. So as part of the weekly governance cycle, these are also all live votes. Uh, so these are all governance polls. Uh, some of them use instant runoff voting. Uh, which basically allows you as a voter to select multiple options and rank them by your choice. Uh, and, uh, and the winner is, is a result of, of everybody doing that. So it's a really great uh, tool if you're okay with two or three of the six options. Uh, it, it kind of helps uh, understand the signal of maker governance a little bit better with some types of votes, uh, like base rate adjustments, I believe. Uh, so yeah. The different polls that are going up, there's a number of Oracle polls, which uh, are from here up to here. So we're whitelisting open, DDEX, Wireern, and Kyber on a number of different Oracles. Uh, then there is a update to the U, uh, ETHUSD data model. I actually have no idea what that is. Uh, so I'm gonna open it and <laughs> kind of see if I could just read this one or two sentence introduction. So as markets and liquidity profiles evolve, it's important to revisit data models for collateral assets to ensure they accurately reflect the new normal. Okay, so this proposal adds FTX, ETHUSD, uh, and Uniswap, ETHUSDC, as price sources for the ETHUSD Oracle and removes Bitfinex, the ETHUSDT pair. Oh, this is really interesting. Yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, basically it's just an update to Setzer, I think it's still called Setzer, but uh, for Maker Oracles, uh, just a quick quick uh, uh, explanation. Uh, for Oracles, uh, for like a given price on the Maker Oracles, there's a number of feed providers. Uh, I think there's like 13 anonymous uh, feed providers, and then there's like another 13 or 14 uh, uh, light feeds. They're called light feeds and dark feeds. The light feeds are typically like an organization, uh, typically a DeFi organization, like uh, I think uh, even Coinlist might be a light feed. I, I forget, like DYDX is a light feed. There's a number of feed providers. And all of these feed providers are taking these uh, prices and uh, selecting a median from them. And uh, these 23 feed providers all submit their medians. And then the, e the actual maker Oracle publishes the median of their medians. So it's very hard to get a fraudulent price. That's kind of the way that Oracles work generally, but that's specifically how our Oracles work. And so this is updating kind of what the standard uh, place to pull uh, data from is. Uh, and this is really good. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, that's really great. Uh, and then, yeah, so besides the Oracle and the data model stuff, uh, there's a the weekly base rate adjustment. I believe the winning vote is 0% base rate. Uh, so go check that out. Uh, and also the current base rate is actually, I believe, 0%. So it's a vote for no change that's winning right now. Uh, there is also a proposal, a governance poll, uh, to signal as an MKR holder whether you think that uh, the domain teams should prioritize real-world assets as collateral. Uh, there's a number of different assets that are uh, starting to look viable. Uh, for example, Centrifuge and Tinlake, uh, they have been doing a ton of work over the last two years to actually uh, engage with the maker community and like set themselves up as one of the first providers of uh, of a real world asset as collateral, and uh, and yeah, so yeah, that's just the signal. It's not implementing anything, and it's not even saying anything super specific. It's just saying we need to prioritize it, right? Uh, and so the last two are also system parameter polls. So one is a poll for adjusting the BAT A debt ceiling from five to ten million. Uh, this is actually because the BAT. 
uh, a debt ceiling was at 100% utilization at one point. Uh, and so it, it came back down, I believe. But nevertheless, uh, since the collateral portfolio has grown so much, there's about 830 million die right now. Uh, a, a small adjustment to the BAT-8 debt ceiling from 5 to 10 million is being proposed by the community. So yeah, check that out. And I think there's already been a signal poll in the forums and people voted for 10 mil. That's why it's showing up as 10 mil on the governance poll. And then uh, the lastly, there is a ETH A risk premium adjustment uh, being voted for. Uh, the community signaled in the forum that they're interested in raising the risk premium from 0% to 2%. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, uh, uh, I definitely think this is a good idea. Uh, the average uh, ETH borrow rate, according to Loan Scan, is actually around 3 to 4%. Uh, that's like Aave, DYDX. So having a 2% risk premium on Maker uh, doesn't really risk like a shrinking of die supply. It's still the best rate on the market for borrowing against your ETH. And also it compensates appropriately the, the protocol for the risk it's taking on ETH. All right, cool. Uh, there's a number of community green light polls. If you don't know what these are, uh, these are basically signaling polls. Uh, so whenever a uh, somebody submits a MIP6 collateral onboarding application, uh, it automatically is set to go to a green light poll. And based on the results of these green light polls, uh, the domain teams uh, are kind of given a signal of what the community wants them to prioritize. Uh, of course, uh, you know the domain teams are not obliged to uh, to follow the strict recommendations of the results of these polls. This is again just signaling. So yeah, and there is a number of new uh, tokens being put up this month. Probably a lot more next month as well. All right, so that's it for like the active polls. There's the green light polls, the weekly governance cycle polls, uh, and then the MIPS monthly governance poll. And there is no current active executive vote as far as I know. Actually, I could probably check really quickly. Actually, should I check? Yeah. I, I think uh, it passed. I don't know. We'll see. And yeah, nothing. All right, cool. There is not. All right, sweet. So uh, some really quick recap of last week's vote. There was an executive vote that passed, a really big, awesome one. Uh, it enabled the TUSD vault type. It reduce, uh, sorry, it reduces the stablecoin liquidation ratios. Uh, and then there's a number of other changes. And these changes uh, are all listed like right here. So uh, this passed on September 18th with 88K MKR, uh, which is pretty awesome turnout. The new, yeah, so so as you can see, the uh, the liquidation ratios on USDC, PAX, TUSD were lowered all to 101%. This means basically that you can get higher leverage on borrowing against these stable coins, which, uh, which helped die supply uh, scale like severely. So these were very important for helping to fix the peg. Uh, and so, yeah, debt ceilings were increased. The base rate was changed from negative two to 0%. And then uh, as a result of this base rate change, all of these stability fees were adjusted. So uh, many of them were uh, adjusted up. Well, I mean, all of them were adjusted up actually. And then there was one small change to the uh, feed key uh, for the Gitcoin feed. So Gitcoin is actually one of the feed providers. It's a light feed for the maker oracles. All right, cool. So that's it for the voting stuff. I'm going to get into updates. And by the way, just want to take a pause here and say, if you are uh, watching in the chat, feel free to ask any questions. I'm happy to uh, discuss them and, and even uh, invite you onto the mic uh, or video if you're interested in going back and forth a little bit. But yeah, so moving forward into updates. So MIPS. Uh, so Charles St. Louis posts a weekly MIPS update. If you want kind of the monthly what's happening, like full details, I highly suggest you check that out. Uh, 
And also, yeah, so yeah, just check that out for the full, full update. But basically, I kind of gave you guys a huge rundown on MIPS already, based on what the active votes are this week. So I'm not going to get into it. Uh, there's a number of proposals in the request for comments phase. Uh, these include uh, the MIPX emergency response MIP, which is basically like setting up a process for what the governance community considers as an emergency response, because everybody is kind of using that word very liberally and maybe inappropriate, inappropriately, like maybe it's not an emergency, maybe it's like urgent or maybe it's like important, but emergency, like that, that's a strong word, right? Uh, and so I kind of respect this MIP. And also, if you didn't know, uh, there is actually a uh, MIP 5 uh, that does cover this exact thing, but, uh, let me kind of show it to you guys. So so there is already an emergency voting kind of pro protocol, but it's very bare. And so I actually suggested that the that MIP, since it's not in the RFC phase still, I suggested it to be actually filed as an amendment to MIP 5 uh, that kind of expands on MIP 5. Uh, so yeah. Uh, MIP 14 is the protocol die transfer. This deals with the problem of, hey, you know, we as the maker protocol want to transfer die from our surplus buffer, or our treasury uh, to a specified Ethereum address. How do we do it, right? So that's what that tackles. MIP 17 is weekly uh, debt ceiling and risk premium adjustments. It kind of, uh, it's working on providing a set logic for these changes so that the governance overhead is severely minimized. Uh, so like we can have potentially automated debt ceiling updates uh, and even uh, kind of automated risk premium adjustments. But the, the risk premium adjustments are a little bit more challenging than the debt ceiling adjustments. Anyway, yeah, there's a lot of details here. So definitely check it out if you're interested. Uh, MIP 20 is in the RFC phase. Uh, this is the target price adjustment module MIP. Uh, it is a a variation of the target rate feedback mechanism from the old, old MakerDAO purple paper. Um, and it's basically a way to institute like the same thing as negative rates. Uh, it's actually very, very interesting. Uh, Lev, uh, who actually used to work at the foundation and pioneered a lot of the uh, formal verification stuff that we did, uh, he put up, put this MIP together and, uh, and he uh, presented it really well on recent uh, governance calls. And I believe if you go into the MIP, I, I should have uh, posted uh, a link to the presentation somewhere here. I might not have, but if you want a link to the presentation, hit me up. I'll send it to you. Uh, but I think that's going to be on my to-do list. I'm going to go put up the time anchored link for his presentation there. Uh, MIP 21 uh, is real world assets, off chain asset backed lender. Uh, it's, uh, I believe, just establishing some process around that uh, about how to become an off chain asset backed lender, if I'm not mistaken. MIP 2022 uh, is uh, related. So it's called the Centrifuge Direct Liquidation Module. So uh, I believe this is actually a technical proposal. So liquidations happen in a certain way, but for real world assets, they're not going to involve like the pure public like keeper market. Uh, they actually have to like real world assets have to have a level of filtration for who can participate in those liquidations. Uh, I believe is 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 the case, and so that's why there has to be a uh, a unique. Uh, liquidation module for real-world assets and Centrifuge as a provider uh, who have their framework for real-world assets is proposing uh, this kind of uh, mechanism and how it works and even proposed code. So really cool. MIP23 uh, is really interesting as well. Uh, I believe this is submitted by Long for Wisdom himself. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and uh, and it deals with domain structure and roles. So as MakerDAO has been uh, growing since MCD launch back in November, uh, I believe we launched in November. Yeah, uh, since uh, MCD launch, uh, we have been as a governance community uh, 
trying to figure out how to structure domain teams, how to structure like mandated actors like Long for Wisdom. He is a elected governance facilitator, for example. Uh, and so I believe this MIP more formally defines the structure of these roles. So check that out if you're interested. And it's in the request for common phase. So all of these are drafts. So treat them as drafts, add your constructive criticism. Any feedback on any of these is uh, greatly appreciated by the MIP authors. Uh, so yeah. And also, by the way, if you didn't know, uh, on the forum, there is something called source cred, which uh, uh, we at the community development department at Maker are actually funding to try to uh, incentivize governance participation on the forums. So uh, there is an algorithm that actually reads your uh, forum activity. And if you are active in the forums, if you uh, post really great feedback, uh, you are actually earning DAI. Uh, and so <clears throat> uh, you can opt into that and actually uh, I will quickly. Um, uh, I will quickly. Uh, oh yeah, actually, I think there was an opting in thing. Oh no, yeah, here it is. Opting in to sort source cred. So here, this is for you, chat. Uh, so you could check that out if you didn't know, but you can opt into it. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think you just have to fill out this form right here, uh, and it's really great. Your participation. Uh, is incentivized. So go give us your awesome feedback. So some quick updates from the smart contracts team and risk. Uh, the smart contracts team recently posted a forum post that uh, begins a conversation about boundaries and expectations for work done by the foundation smart contracts team on behalf of the community. Uh, you know, because the community, there's been such a huge volume of ideas uh, and collateral applications, et cetera, et cetera. And a, a, a big realization is that the development work is, is a big part of the bottleneck of why we can't move faster. And the smart contracts team, of course, are people with lives that need like sleep, right? Uh, so they can't be just bots working 24 seven for the whims of the governance community. Uh, and, so, uh, and so Kurt posted this really great uh, short thread uh, explaining that, you know, yeah, the, the smart contracts team, they have to balance a number of different responsibilities, protocol improvements, operational work like collateral onboarding and creating the weekly, monthly executives, providing smart contract expertise to integrators, the community, reviewing proposals here on the forum. Uh, they have to do like uh, smart contract assessments on collateral applications, for example. Uh, and then also creating as much automation and documented processes as possible. Uh, so the smart contracts team is bearing a huge load. People don't give them, I mean, everybody kind of takes them for granted because they are providing just such a, a infinitely valuable uh, function to, to make her success. And so this kind of explains that, you know, their time is finite. Uh, and these are kind of the things that you should think, think about, you know, uh, they're, they're doing the best they can. So don't be too hard on them. Uh, and read that, uh, read the thread if, if you want a little bit more, but I'm not gonna get so deep into it right now. I actually might, uh, if uh, if Brian is here actually, no, Brian's not here today, yeah. Anyway, okay, cool. So moving forward, uh, risk team update. So uh, Primoz let us know that the team is currently working on collateral evaluations for the October cycle, which is coming up for BAL, YFI, PAX Gold, and LEND. So these are the next risk uh, assessments that you can expect to be posted on the forum. So this is really great. Uh, Primoz also posted a help wanted thread looking for a person who's interested in building risk monitoring tools and working with the risk domain team more formally. So if you are a person or know a person who is interested in helping with maker risk uh, and can build risk monitoring tools, uh, definitely reach out to Primoz. Uh, he is uh, a lot of fun to work with. I have had uh, some pleasure to do that myself. And all right, yeah, that's it for the team updates and the MIPS update. There, uh, There's also some current events updates. So vault compensation, uh, yeah. So the vault compensation plan approval poll actually ended or is ending today. 
Uh, it might have actually just ended half an hour ago, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and I believe that um, I believe that it, it ended with uh, zero compensation winning. Yeah. Uh, uh, what was the readout for that, by the way, Tim? How how much maker was for or against? Do you have that on hand? So 57K for 0%. And how much was for the uh, other two? 15,000 MKR for 18%. 14,000 MKR for 15%. Yeah, so it was about 30,000 MKR for more than zero, and then 57,000 MKR for zero. And so, uh, yeah, that's kind of... Uh, 38 unique voters. Yeah, so that's uh, that's the MKR signal for uh, the vault compensation plan. So I, I believe that kind of uh, puts it in the ground. I'm not sure what the next steps are, actually. I believe we're going to hear something about it, uh, up, you know, some update about it on the Thursday governance call. So stay tuned for that. Uh, and so, yeah, I find it pretty, pretty unfortunate. Yeah, personally. But, oh, well, I mean... Yeah, I guess more discussion will ensue in the coming uh, week. So, uh, yeah, and also if you go into the Maker Relay, you can see what the compensation plan was. Monet, uh, Supply, and Maker Man, and I believe a few others put a ton of work into specking this out for the community and actually iterating on the first one as well. Uh, and also there is a Black Thursday Vault Owners Report thread, which is just the individual users of vaults that... Uh, that actually lost out because of the zero bid auctions. So anyway, yeah, moving forward. Uh, update on collateral onboarding. There is a new initiative for collateral onboarding grants, uh, and these fund community members interested in working on collateral onboarding and provide special incentives for rewarding collective collaboration. Uh, and I believe uh, these are our largest grants to date. Uh, we are... Let me just get the uh, get the amounts here. So for your interest, on top of on top of receiving a grant for outlined work, an additional grant incentive of seventy five thousand dies split amongst participating grantees and domain teams working on collateral onboarding will be released at a two hundred and fifty million die milestone, with a second additional fund release of a hundred thousand die at the five hundred million die milestone. So this is really really cool. Uh, yeah, this is really this is great. So yeah, check this out uh, if you're interested in putting together a team or individually contributing to collateral onboarding. Uh, message Amy and uh, uh, definitely express your interest. Uh, also, related to collateral onboarding, there is a discussion on improvements to the collateral onboarding framework. Uh, in summary, the mandated actors, uh, so Charles, Long for Wisdom, representatives of like the foundation, uh, they've kind of come together. Actually, I don't know if represent. I don't know if Maker Foundation reps are part of the mandated actors thing. Yeah, scratch that. But either way, uh, these are kind of the uh, proposed changes. They are going to a forum signal poll before anything. So this isn't. This hasn't happened yet. This is just being proposed. Uh, but we are going to be, uh, and the reason for the proposal is to be more flexible in collateral onboarding. So uh, we want to suspend the usage of MIPS 8, 10, 11, and 12 effective immediately. We want to explicitly allow collateral onboarding to be a flexible process that it can adjust to the demands of reality. Uh, we want to publish and maintain a public document with all collateral types listed and prioritized according to their varying risks and benefits. And uh, we want to provide foundation-funded grants for collateral onboarding to allow the community to take more role of the process. And that's what this is, right? So one of them is happening, regardless of if people want it or not. But uh, this one, this is kind of uh, this is the main thing, right? The suspension of the MIPS because the MIPS are what have been solidified by the community. So there just needs to be a signal that the community is okay with that, and also okay with this general statement. So yeah, check that out. We're trying to be more flexible with collateral onboarding. And by we, I mean the DAO. So yeah. 
Uh, yeah, so I mentioned this uh, actually at the very beginning of the call, but uh, new badges are coming to the forum. So join this Thursday's Governance and Risk call. You can click here if you are following on the Maker Relay uh, for an introduction to the MakerDAO badges. Uh, yeah, so they're going to introduce the MakerDAO badges on the Risk call. And so the badges reward individuals for participating in MakerDAO in various ways. And they display in the forum. So like uh, if you've ever sent to Tendai, voted on a governance poll, uh, bid on a collateral auction, like there's a number of really, really great uh, uh, artworks. And these are hidden purposefully just to kind of give you guys um, an incentive to join. You could see a little here. Let me, let me zoom in. Uh, bite an unsafe vault. I wonder whose whiskers these are. I mean, it looks like whiskers to me. <laughs> Uh, and hint, I've already seen these art, uh, these uh, the artwork, so it's not a reveal to me. But uh, I'm kind of teasing you guys. Uh, these are really, really well done by an artist named Richard Rosa. Uh, he is a fantastic artist uh, who designed these NFTs, and so definitely tune into the governance call for, for that. All right, so we're what at 12:42. I'm gonna take a quick breath, drink of water. All right, so quick update on the state of the peg. So the peg has been uh, continued to float above a dollar uh, since I believe even January. So this whole year we've been floating at around a dollar and a penny. Uh, but recently with uh, a ton of the uh, uh, farming opportunities, there has been a, a lot of demand for dye. And so at certain points, we've seen the volume weighted average price, which is this pink line here, uh, go as high as a dollar and four cents. And this was on September 15th, right? Uh, this is right before we added the USDC debt ceiling increase to, I believe, 200 million or 400 million. And we lowered the liquidation, uh, uh, sorry, the collateralization ratio so that more people can draw die from smaller amount of starting capital. So that actually very positively affected the peg, as well as the fact that uh, safe farming, there was a, a, a yield farming thing called safe, it actually ended. And so a ton of die uh, pressure was alleviated as well. And so we saw that dollar and four volume weighted average price drop down. And it's been sitting kind of at as of September 21st, at around a dollar and a penny again. So that's been great. And uh, if you're looking at this this chart in general, which can be found on die.decipher.io, uh, I believe it's linked somewhere here, but don't worry about it. I, I could link it in the chat for you guys later. All of these little dots are kind of individual trades on these ver this variety of uh, exchanges, in including Coinbase and like popular decentralized exchanges like Uniswap. Uniswap, and as you could see, like many of the die trades are using Uniswap primarily, or maybe I'm just like colorblind and see this more prominently than the other colors. Uh, who knows? Uh, but as you can see, it's also overshadowed by this 24-hour ETH price drop that we've been experiencing. And so, very recently, we've seen die trade at about a dollar at certain points of the day. Of the day. Uh, and for those of you that kind of are getting familiar with how markets work, uh, being involved in crypto, uh, of you know, DAI trades at different prices throughout the day. So the volume weighted average price is kind of a good metric. This is the 24 hour vo volume weighted average price, but you could do a volume weighted average price over you know 90 days, a week, whatever you want. Uh, and I believe the volume weighted average price for like the year or something might be something like a dollar and a penny if that was if i had to guess and so yeah uh maker continues to really really try hard to uh onboard new assets which we're gonna see a bunch of in the coming months <clears throat> onboard real world assets to uh to hedge the total collateral portfolio so right now we have crypto assets like eth and mana and zrx and we also have stable coins which are price stable and like far less risky with regards to liquidations. And the, the next part of the collateral portfolio really is real world assets. And that's to have a lot of uncorrelated priced assets uh, backing DAI. Uh, and this ultimately <clears throat> creates a far stronger stable coin. So yeah, I'm not gonna read through all of these uh, points. Feel free to check it out yourself. 
but check this out. Uh, we actually have 830 million die. I believe that's actually a very, very current number. Yeah. So 839 million die outstanding right now, which is uh, quite remarkable. We're, I believe we're going to hit a billion before the new year, which uh, is, is exciting as hell. Uh, and so, yeah, record high die supply. Uh, really great. Uh, and a majority of that die supply, of course, came from a number of stable coins like TUSD, um, but more like USDC primarily. There's 321 million die from USDC. Uh, yeah. And then uh, 86 million from WBTC. Those are kind of the leaders. And uh, for reference, there's a really great rundown by the total supply of die here on MakerBurn. So you could see ETH is the leader, USDCA is the secondary, WBCTC is third, and then these two stable coins are next. And then everything under that is like not really significant. BAT is doing pretty well, actually. Three and a half million from BAT. And you can also see the annual fee run out. So uh, the protocol is actually earning 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, over 18 million uh, in annual fees right now, which is exciting. All right, moving forward. Uh, haha, yeah, PAX A has been sitting at 99% utilization. That's actually very true. And I believe uh, the, a debt ceiling increase might be coming for PAX. Where's PAX? Yeah, 29.7 out of 30 million. Uh, and then the die volume has been 259 million over the last week, at least across these exchanges. So that's really really great and this is the average volume weight I believe this is the weekly volume weighted average price yeah seven day VWAP so uh, as you can see it's a little bit bimodal but really yeah it's really interesting cool yeah so that's enough of me uh, on the state of the peg uh, oh yeah and the link to die decipher is here so if you want to check out this chart uh, Vishesh put together the site it's really great you can, uh, you can adjust the time period of these graphs. Uh, you can also filter out the minimum trade size. It's very useful. Um, I'll give you guys an example. Also, if you want to just look at stuff like the vault, like this is the 24, this is a plotted graph of the 24 hour volume weighted average price across seven days. So as you could see, it fell from 104 and it's been flat. So this is really, really great, actually. This is looking very good. And with more die supply and more collateral, we hope to get this actually back down to about a dollar and oscillating above and below regularly. But yeah, check that out. All right, so some updates on the community. Uh, haven't done these in a while. We usually run out of time, but today I had the whole call to go through Maker Relay, so that's fun. Uh, so articles and thought pieces, uh, how Ethereum smart contracts power DAI, the Maker Protocol and DeFi. This is a really great introductory article for people looking into MakerDAO. It was published by the MakerDAO blog, which uh, is the foundation team and the writers uh, working to educate new users on how this stuff works. So this is obviously for like a slightly more uh, a slightly more advanced like person or technically minded person, this is a great thing to send to a buddy. So try to do that if you will. Our network uh, part two, so this week's issue part two did a ton of maker coverage. Uh, it was actually done by Marco who is on uh, Primosha's team. Uh, he, I believe he works for Block Analytica and uh, Vishesh Chowdhury who is the guy behind Die.Decipher. So our network has a, has a really, really great writers, generally speaking, and so this is the MakerDAO contribution, and there's a ton more analysis. So I did, I kind of gave the the overview, but these guys really go in hard. So if you're interested in more analysis about the die peg and the collaterals and the behavior this week, uh, check that out. A couple of things in the videos and podcast section. So uh, MakerDAO founder Rune Christensen sits on a panel of DeFi experts hosted by Chain Reaction host Tom Sh Shaughnessy. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, check that out. And then also Tech Intersect number 34. 
Uh, MakerDAO General Counsel Brian Avello joins to uh, Tonya M. Evans to discuss the role of law in blockchain, cryptocurrency, and DeFi. And Tonya M. Evans is actually on the Maker Foundation board, which uh, is really great. Uh, I believe she was added to the board a few months ago. All right, uh, Maker Forum Deep Dive. So uh, really quickly, if you do want kind of a general update on what's happening in the forum, there is a really great thread that's updated regularly called Governance at a Glance. Uh, at a Glance. I guess you have to type the whole thing or some part of it. Uh, oh no. I went over the post edit limit on the forum. Oh no, that's October. Yeah, so I guess we can go back up. And he he writes when he last updates it. So long for wisdom, our governance facilitator dutifully updates this as he sees fit. So this was last updated on the 17th, just a five days ago. So it's pretty pretty up to date. So I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. But uh, if you wanna check out all the active stuff, not all the active stuff, but a lot of the active discussions, see, like, you know, signal request threads, ongoing initiatives, help wanted stuff. You can you could check out the governance at a glance uh, thread. So definitely check that out if you like. But anyway, going back to Maker Relay, uh, Maker DAO standard governance processes. So Long for Wisdom lays out a current overview of the governance processes, including information about how to do forum signal requests. Anybody can post a forum signal request. You don't have to ask for permission. Uh, and all this other stuff. So, yeah, check that out. Uh, Gregory de Prisco GDIP kicked off a discussion about about stable credit, which is uh, Yearns uh, Andre Cronier's idea, uh, or he kind of drafted it out in a Medium post, um, and whether or not aspects of the protocol might be useful to MakerDAO. So. Uh, interesting thought piece. Greg is still trying to wrap his mind around it, as am I. I have no idea how stable credit works. Uh, I've been trying to understand, but my stupid brain can't really understand. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, moving on. Uh, using DAI in blacklisted countries by USA government and USDC legal compliance. So uh, a community member raised an important issue over the accessibility of DAI in countries blacklisted by the US government. So check that out. Uh, give me one second. Sorry. Okay, cool. Anyway. Uh, yeah, so interesting discussions happening. Uh, the tweet of the week chosen by the Maker Relay team is this. Spencer Noon's uh, not going to lie, fam. I hate the term protocol politician. Can we please come up with something better? And I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, nobody likes politicians. Screw politicians. Like we need, we need truth. We need like protocol truth people or something. I don't know. I'm kind of just talking out of my out of my butt. But uh, but yeah, like protocol politician is is kind of a a weird term, right? Like it, it, it because po politics really relies more on like psyops and and like mass kind of like it doesn't really rely on like rational like rational argumentation it relies more on like manipulating your constituency or something like that. Yeah. Anyway, I, I, I vibe with this tweet. I hope you do too. But, uh, if you have an idea for a better term than protocol politician, by all means, uh, at me, <laughs> uh, so, or at Spencer Newton, better yet. Uh, cool. And we're coming up to the last five minutes of the call. So really quick, I'm going to go through the meetings and events that are happening. This is the community call happening now, so you could ignore that. Uh, there is a community collateral onboarding call that happens bi-weekly on Wednesdays uh, at 1700 UTC. Uh, check it out. Uh, an agenda is typically posted here, and it's happening tomorrow. So tomorrow, Stanny from Ave is going to present Lend. Tyler Winklevoss himself and Gemini will provide uh, will present GOSD. I wonder if Tyler is actually going to make it to the call. I would I will be super impressed if he does. That would be very cool. But GOSD and Lend are the topics of discussion for tomorrow's collateral onboarding call. So check that out. Governance and risk happens weekly on Thursdays. You could check out uh, the uh, come upcoming agenda here. Uh, so we're on episode 111. Uh, and that's going to be on the 24th, this coming Thursday. Uh, and so, yeah, you can check that out here. 
community events. Uh, I believe these are uh, virtual events. So September 30th, Stablecoins Demystified, the why, how, and where. On October 1st, we have a Blockchain Education in Africa event. And there's a number of uh, hackathons going on right now. I believe they're all virtual. And yeah, with that, four minutes left on the clock. Uh, if you have feedback about the Maker Relay, I highly recommend uh, you post in the forum with your uh, with like any typos you see, any like formatting ideas you have. Uh, you could also take the survey, which is a really really brief uh, uh, Google form survey. It's like yeah, literally like four questions. Uh, or join us in the community development channel and like, you know, voice your opinion there. Uh, I believe posting the forum and the survey are the two best places. So definitely, definitely give us feedback. The team would greatly appreciate it. And so if you've enjoyed this, definitely make it a regular habit to go to this link. Which, by the way, I guess I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Uh, which, by the way, there is a link to the Maker Relay thing. It's right there. There's a green button. I know on YouTube, on the recording, you can't see it, but here on Crowdcast, if you're watching this live, the eight people that are here, there's a button right there, and uh, bookmark that button. Uh, also, Maker Relay was just translated into Portuguese, <laughs> so uh, really, really awesome. Yeah, so Ch uh, Chow just did that. That's exciting. S sweet. Uh, yeah, news is always happening here. So with that being said, uh, happy Tuesday, everyone. Hope this was uh, a good one. I hope uh, that this information was valuable to you. And uh, and yeah, I look forward to next week's. And I believe the governance comms team has reserved next week's slot. So it might potentially be a guest host. Who knows? But uh, look out for the event page on Friday. Uh, and really quick before I end the call, I see Matt posted a reminder for the extended Q&A for the Declaration of Intent off-chain asset-backed lender for real-world assets. Uh, call starts when the weekly community call ends, and check out that Zoom link. Oh, I didn't even know about this. Oh, cool. So I'm actually going to... I might actually join this for a little bit. Oh, yeah, cool. So, yeah, Matthew Rabinowitz in the house. Thank you for that reminder, Matt. That's perfect. All right, anyway, ending the recording, and uh, happy Tuesday to you all. Cheers.